Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Hey everyone, Craig Baird here. Before I begin today's story, I want to take a moment and ask that you check me out on Patreon at www.patreon.com slash CanadaEHX. There are several tiers with great benefits, from ad-free content to t-shirts and other cool stuff. As well, if you're a fan of Canadian history, make sure you check out all of my shows, from John to Justin, Canadian History X, Canada, A Yearly Journey, and Pucks and Cups, along with Canada's Great War. And don't forget, you can also donate directly to the show at www.canadaehx.com. Just click Donate. It helps keep this show going. Okay, on with the show. Today is Truth and Reconciliation Day, an important day when we recognize the history of the Canadian residential school system. In honor of this day, I have a special episode of Canadian History X. I'll be talking to Danae Robinson, writer, director, and executive producer of True Story Part 2, which airs on the History Channel tonight and on Stack TV. With Danae is Rebecca Robinson, also a writer and executive producer of the program. We will cover the importance of this day and how True Story came about and more. Throughout this episode, I will also have clips from that program. Who ensured that assimilationist policies were enforced in Indigenous communities? Every Indigenous community, every reserve in this country had an Indian agent from the 1870s until the 1960s. The Indian agent was responsible for ensuring that the children attended school, either day school on the reserve or residential schools. He was responsible for recording marriages, birth, death. The Indian agent also had certain powers to act as justice of the peace. So for minor criminal affairs, the Indian agent was both judge, jury, and executioner. So hardly fair. To a large degree, the Indian agent also was able to interfere in banned politics. If the Indian agent didn't like you or your family for a particular reason, they could have quite considerable control over your life. They could deny you your annuity payment for that year if they felt that you weren't being a good, upstanding Christian citizen. That level of control, that level of intimate control. Tell me first, what is True Story Part 2 about? All right, uh, so True Story Part 2 takes off where we left off in Part uh, part 1, uh, so that's at the creation of the Indian Act of 1876, and we talk about events and topics that have happened in between up until uh, current time. And should people watch Part 2 before they watch Part, or Part 1 before they watch Part 2? It's not required, but uh, it, it gives people a better sense of of, of the history that has been on these lands you know, for, for since time immemorial, we talk about um, pre-contact and how Indigenous people were living and thriving on these lands. And then we talk about contact. What happened then? You know, Christopher Columbus did not discover America. Um, so we kind of, we myth bust as well. And, um, and we talk about what happened at contact because it wasn't negative right in the beginning you know there were positive relationships there were relationships of commerce so we kind of we examine where that relationship kind of turned and I guess at its pinnacle at its peak was at the creation of the Indian Act and why was it created and so part two takes up from there and then part two we talk about what is the Indian Act exactly? What are the oppressive laws? Because some of them um, still impact Indigenous people up until this day. And many people don't under or realize that. Uh, we talk about status, uh, the misrepresentation of status or um, who gets it, because uh, not every Indigenous person is a quote status Indian. We talk about uh, treaties, the importance of the treaties, because there would be no Canada without these treaties and what were negotiated in them. So we, we, we talk about these big topics, but we also talk about personal experiences. A lot of our knowledge keepers have firsthand experiences in um, a lot of these events and topics that we do talk about. And then how did this idea for True Story come about? My business partner, Lisa Meaches, um, who's Anishinaabe from Long Plain First Nation and Sandy Bay First Nation and Ebb and Flow First Nation, um, to see if there was some way that we could 
create a show to honor TRC Day last year. And against all odds, because the timeline was very tight, Danae created True Story Part One. And at that time, we said to them, we can't encapsulate the history of Indigenous people and settlers in Canada in a two hour chunk. We need more. And so our hope was that we would get two feature docs, um, you know, to honor TRC Day in back to back years. And now our hope is, is that we can have a series that emerges from this so that we can dig even deeper into this rich history and these rich relationships. Hi, I'm Bernard Perley. I am Willis Duguid from Nequitquit. I'm from Tobik First Nation. I am of the Maliseet Nation. Peace and friendship were the terms of the treaties that were signed here on the East. And this is before Confederation. After Confederation, there was a different kind of program that the Canadian state imposed upon Indigenous peoples. At this point, the Canadian state wanted to consolidate its own territorial sovereignty and its domination over Indigenous peoples. And that led to the kinds of treaties, numbered treaties, that required the ceding of traditional lands. Even though we signed these friendship treaties, the Indian Act did impose the kind of government domination of Indian governance systems. Ah, the Indian Act of 1876, masterminded by Canada's first Prime Minister, Sir John A. Macdonald. Though amended, it still stands to this day, impacting nearly every aspect of Indigenous peoples' lives, often to devastating effect. The eradication of languages, cultural beliefs, spiritual practices, and even the stewardship of the land were aspects of that kind of colonial erasure of indigenous lifeways and worldviews. How long did it take to kind of write everything up, do interviews and put True Story together? Like you mentioned, it was a very quick turnaround. Yeah, it was it was it was very fast. Um I I think we we were in development very quick and of course loved what we put together. We had I would say a month and a half to record to get all the interviews from coast to coast for visiting our knowledge keepers in their communities. So it was a very fast turnout, as Rebecca mentioned. So it was a, a matter of months. One of the things that Danae did that's brilliant from the beginning was to involve knowledge keepers in the process of development. So we knew from across the country, from different nations, what story we could tell and how we could do it in a good way. And in part one, we had a smaller group of knowledge keepers who aided in development. And then for part two, we invited most of the people who became subjects of the doc to participate in development. So that really helped smooth the process and make sure that we were able to, to do things the absolute best we could. Now, one thing that really stuck out for me in the synopsis was you mentioned that there are raw themes, but then you're also mixing in moments of hope. So why is it important to ensure that you still have that kind of that hope and uplifting themes as part of this? Oh, well, oftentimes when we hear about Indigenous history, and I say that in quotations because this is really Canada's history of what happened to Indigenous people, oftentimes it's it's all, you know, negative. It's all, um, w- w- which it is, a lot of it is horrific and oppressive, but there are moments of good, of, um, of celebration, because we did survive genocide. We still have our languages. We still have our culture. And uh, I thought it was very important to capture lighter moments and moments of hope and and celebratory moments as well when, you know, particularly when we honor our veterans and the contributions that they made as well. So uh, we thought it was a great balance. It was very important to me that we highlight our triumphs as well. Danae also infuses this dark, cheeky sense of humor throughout. So that, I think, helps people to be able to take it in is when we can laugh about things together. 
And was one of the goals of the program to show that things like residential schools and things like the 60s scoop are not distant history, but something many alive today have experienced. And you also mentioned uh, intergenerational trauma as well. Yeah, it, it, absolutely. As I mentioned, a lot of the topics we talk about are experienced firsthand by our knowledge keepers. So it's not um, reported or spoken about in a way where it's kind of removed. These are people's actual experiences. And even as a granddaughter of a residential school survivor, uh, I've experienced firsthand what these experiences are. I've I've seen it in my family. I've seen it in community. So it, um, it, it it's very real. And um, I think a lot of people don't fully grasp the impact that it has on people. As, as you said, it's not in the past. It, it is mm-hmm. still very prevalent today. One of my favorite parts of True Story Part 2 is that Danae's own grandmother, who's a residential school survivor, is part of the process and is in the recreations. And there's this moment where we were filming Danae's grandmother teaching her language to one of the other actors who was a little girl. And the smile on Danae's grandmother's face, it just lights up the world. It was such a beautiful moment. And I think that those recreations were a real part of sharing the triumph and also some of the the darkness in Canada's history, because some of the actors really had those experiences themselves. The attempt to erase Indigenous culture, family ties, and rights to land and treaty rights didn't stop at tearing children from family and home communities. In 1969, Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau and his Minister of Indian Affairs and future Prime Minister Jean Chrétien unveiled a policy paper that proposed ending the special legal relationship between Aboriginal peoples and the Canadian state and to dismantle the Indian Act. That sounds good, right? But what did it mean exactly? Enter the white paper. So in 1969, shortly after the the federal government had done a massive report where they consulted Indigenous peoples across the country asking for, you know, our thoughts on, you know, the direction that Indian affairs should be taking. Then Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau and Jean Chrétien, who was then Minister of Indian Affairs, came up with what was then called the 1969 White Paper on Indian Policy. And essentially what the White Paper proposed was the entire elimination of treaties, reserves, the Indian Act and the Department of Indian Affairs within five years. So treaties were to be eliminated, no more future treaties were to be negotiated, Reserves were to be converted into municipalities. Our rights, our privileges, our benefits as First Nations peoples was to be eliminated through the disappearance of the Indian Act. And we were to become Canadian citizens living in municipalities, rural municipalities like every other Canadian across the country. Okay, so basically elimination, termination, assimilation in one fell swoop. Okay, that was the idea. When I talk about dark parts of Canada's history on my show, uh, I will have people contact me and say, well, why don't we leave stuff like that in the past and just move on? Why is it so important that we do confront our past and dark aspects of it and also learn from it? It's something that is really important to us because part of it for me is that I'm of settler descent. And for me, it's that this isn't history that we should leave in the past. This is happening now. A lot of the intergenerational impact and a lot of the benefits that we receive from the process of colonization, it's very real now. And we can see with, in our province in Manitoba, cries to search the landfill that are very real right now. I met the daughter of one of the women who is murdered and she gave me a pin that she had made um she's just a teenage girl and it was a little red dress that she made with her friend who also lost a loved one to violence and this isn't the past this is now the saying is those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it and i think um as rebecca is saying you know right now if we have politicians who are running on the slogan we will not search the landfill i think that shows 
that there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. And speaking of that, what can Canadians do to continue to move reconciliation forward? I think it's just being able to listen with an open mind and an open heart. I think a lot of the times It is hard to hear about things because a lot of people have a misconception about what Canada is. And that is, and it's not that same experience for everybody. And, you know, while Canada is a great place, there is some things that need to be worked out. And I think just being able to learn and to take away something small from it. And to be able to acknowledge it, um, a lot of our knowledge keepers said there can be no reconciliation without the truth. So I think that's where we need to start is just by learning the truth and just acknowledging it that this these things have happened and they are continuing to happen. That's something that our narrator, Dio Horn, says right at the beginning of part two. This isn't a blame game or a shame game. This is about facing the truth together so that we can move forward to reconciliation. And there can't be any reconciliation without the truth. In our context, in thinking about the effects of the Indian Act and the effects of settler colonialism in general, enfranchisement for Indians or Indigenous peoples meant that you lost your Indian status so that you can gain Canadian citizenship. In the early years of the Canadian state, when they implemented the Gradual Civilization Act, they hoped for voluntary enfranchisement from Indigenous peoples. So they hoped that Indigenous peoples would willingly give up their Indian status to become full Canadian citizens and all the rights incurred through that designation. However, Indigenous peoples far and wide and as a whole, in general, were really resistant to voluntarily giving up their unique and inherent rights as the original nations of these lands. So what happened after that was the government finding new ways, more paternalistic, more violent, more dehumanizing ways to ensure that that enfranchisement would take place. So, for example, some of the ways that Indigenous peoples were enfranchised vis-a-vis the Indian Act include Indigenous women marrying a non-Indigenous man, perhaps going into the military or enlisting for military service, or even in many cases obtaining a university education, particularly in the legal or medical field. Uh, It comes out on September 30th, which is Truth and Reconciliation Day. Why is that such an important day for things like this and to take stock and and to look at the past, but also look at the future? Well, I think a lot of people are are starting to to understand what TRC Day actually means. And, And it starts by, you know, acknowledging the experience of residential school survivors and that these atrocities did happen. It's not an easy thing to talk about, and it's not an easy thing to make, and it's not an easy thing to put out into the world. And I know for me, a lot of people are like, orange shirt day, TRC day, I don't know what that is. I don't know what the calls to action are. And having a day that we can come together, all together across the country, and be quiet and listen and take it in, and be thoughtful and mindful that's where real healing is going to come from and Danae talks about the moments of triumph in these films there can be triumph for all of us together if we listen to each other and then in the end what do you hope people get out of watching true story part one and part two uh some of the greatest compliments that i received from part one or that we received from part one was that a lot of the knowledge and topics that were shared was people were hearing it for the first time or they said I I never knew that or I was never taught that and I feel very strongly that they're going to have the same takeaways with part two. We have quizzes at the end of each act of the film that lead us into the commercial breaks and those are really great takeaways too. It's just something tangible and meaningful that you can share. And if people can share pieces of this history and 
take on pieces of this as our own history together, then to me, that would be one of the greatest takeaways. This National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. My dad was taken in forcefully off my grandma's arms. The story behind a heartbreaking and astonishing piece of Canadian history continues. Canadians have been strategically misinformed about Indigenous people from the very beginning. The feature documentary, True Story Part 2, Saturday at 9, only on the History Channel. Stream True Story Part 1, now on Stack TV and the Global TV app.